on Sky News Australia. This is the Rita Panahi Show. Good evening and welcome to the Rita Panahi Show. Coming up tonight, calls for the e-safety commissioner to step down after a trans controversy that sees billionaire tech giant Elon Musk suing the Australian government. And which sporting star is under fire for saying men who identify as women should be able to compete against real women? Joining me tonight, we'll have a star actor, a heartthrob, who found himself cancelled by Hollywood because of his support of Donald Trump. He'll be in the studio shortly. And as always, plenty of lefties losing it, including Gwesha Thunberg. <laughs> We have a lot of news to cover. Let's bring in Sky News contributor Prue McSween. Let's start with the front page of the Herald Sun today, which reveals that violent videos of Aussie kids stealing cars, taking drugs, breaking into homes are not being removed from social media sites like Facebook, Instagram and TikTok, despite their content clearly being in breach of those uh, guidelines, the content guidelines people are supposed to abide by. Uh, the filming of Crimes Crew is being committed, um, has driven more and more instances of youth crime activity. And we've got child psychologists who are saying that the recognition and praise youngsters get online is a massive motivation for risk taking. So why do we have the e-safety commissioner trying to silence conservatives rather than actually cracking down on these tech companies that are possibly adding to the youth crime crisis? Well, she's demonstrated that she shouldn't be in the job. She's taken her eye off the ball, or maybe she never had it on the ball. You know, there's talk that she actually was a, is having a vendetta against her previous employer, Twitter. Uh, what she's doing or not doing is really enabling these kids uh, to do these crimes and encouraging them. And uh, you know, I, I'm just at a loss. But what's the point of having guidelines if no one's going to prosecute them and and uh, insist that these people, these huge companies, and to my mind, they're publishers, and they should be under the same rules that every other publisher of news and information uh, is subject to. And clearly, she's not doing her job. The government's not doing its job. They're just seeing to throw their hands up in the air and say, we don't know what we can do. We haven't got an answer to this problem. Oh, whilst we're on the e-safety commissioner, Julie Inman-Grant, uh, she demanded X, formerly Twitter, remove a post calling this trans man a woman, despite the trans man, Teddy Cook, using X to promote all sorts of activity like bondage, bestiality and group sex and uploading other X-rated photos and posts. Well, it turns out that Teddy Cook and Julie Inman Grant used to work together, Prue, with Teddy providing advice to the Commissioner on online LGBTQ plus resources. Uh, I do wonder, did she disclose their past working relationship where her office demanded X remove the offending post or risk a six-figure fine? Uh, calls for her to step down over this, Prue. I do think we need a little bit more transparency and precisely how these decisions are made and, and when there is pressure applied on a social media company to remove a post. Well, she's clearly, uh, you know, one of the woke brigade and, and our government favourite. She's been employed under this socialist government and she's doing, you know, doing what she believes could be its bidding of, uh, you know, being, you know, some more than generous to the woke and the, the LGBTQ alphabet people. And clearly, uh, you know, she's doing their, their bidding and quite ineffective. But she mustn't have disclosed this relationship, this friendship with this person, uh, surely she would have had to, you know, come out with it and say, you know, I need to step away, I can't be involved in this. But she has questionable principles, one would, would think, and uh, I think we're walking on very dangerous ground with her. Well, you say she's doing the bidding of a, of a socialist government. Uh, I'm pretty sure it was the previous coalition government that appointed Astounding. her. And it's just a long, 
It's not the first and it won't be the last. We do know when the coalition are in power, they make mistakes like this on a fairly mm. consistent basis. And we saw that with Aisha Butrose. We, we've seen it time and time again. Now, all of this comes as uh, the world's richest man, the owner of X, Elon Musk, is taking legal action against the Australian government after Julia Inman Grant forced X to uh, remove that post by Teddy Cook. And... Prue, that may be a very expensive exercise for the Australian taxpayer. Now, let's move on to the US. So a woman's basketball coach has been mocked for being a coward and a reality denier. That's some of the uh, heat she's copying online after she said it was fine for men who identify as women to play in women's sporting competitions. Have a look. One of the major issues facing women's sports right now is the debate, discussion topic about the inclusion of transgender athletes, biological males in women's sports. I was wondering if you would tell me your position on that issue. If you're a woman, you should play. If you consider yourself a woman or, and you want to play sports or, or vice versa, you should be able to play. That's, that's my opinion. You want me to go deeper? Do you, do you think uh, transgender women should be able to participate. That, that, that's your question you want basketball. me to ask. I mean, you want to ask, so I'll, I'll give you that. Yes. <laughs> Prue, Dawn Stale is also getting plenty of praise from the left naturally, but she is copying a little bit of heat from a lot of women's rights campaigners who say she's uh, throwing her own athletes under the bus with this sort of uh, position. Well, there's no doubt she is, but She's on some sort of a huge contract, like three million bucks a year. So she would rather be selling her principles. Uh, maybe she does believe that it's fine for women to be competing against men who can be, you know, testosterone fueled and dangerous to play. She's selling out the, the women players and I hope she can sleep well at night. It's pretty pathetic. I'll have more to say on that particular bit of lunacy later in the program in our Lefties Losing It. Let's talk about the Albanese government paying consultants for advice on how to address Victoria's forecasted uh, electricity supply shortfall. Uh, Pru, you know you're in deep, deep trouble when even Climate Change Minister Chris Bowen's department, with all its reckless energy policies, thinks your energy plan is... Uh, too radical and perhaps grim. It shows just how Victoria is just completely off the reservation when it comes to this area. Look, surely Bowen, when he's sleeping at night or trying to sleep at night, must be realising that this ideology that he's inflicted on us is not working. And, you know, to be that desperate that he has to then appoint, you know, consultants in Victoria to try and help him out to solve his problem, that Victoria is going to be in the dark. It's not going to have the energy to fulfil its needs and keep the, light, keep the lights on. And the guy is just, you know, we, they've de demonised gas, as we know. They're sitting on huge gas reservations, but they will not do anything about it. And this ideology is going to just make Victorians suffer. Uh, we had to have that s a situation with Tasmania where they were relying on the Varanus line to, to provide gas. That's not working. Uh, Queensland's coming to the party, but there's going to come a time when every state is going to run out. And if you're relying on renewables, well, this country is going to go to the dark. And we all know that. Bowen must know it. His, his uh, AEMO people are starting to tell him, you know, he has to face reality. And he's inflicting this on the rest of us. And we know all we're doing is paying through the nose. We will continue to pay through the nose for expensive, unreliable energy while he's in power. Now, staying in Victoria, tourism bodies, maritime groups and cruise ship companies are calling on Melbourne's docks uh, to be refurbished. They're in urgent need of a facelift. Uh, if the city wants to be a go-to destination for the growing cruising market, uh, we've got Sydney and Brisbane cleaning up, Prue, but Melbourne, it's just a terrible experience for travellers who are coming in by ship. Uh, the uh, public transport is really quite terrible here. The, the 
ticketing systems confusing, there's traffic nightmare, there's, a, there's a, a traffic mayhem every time a big ship comes in and the tourist experience is just one that's very poor compared to other Australian ports. And again, this mm. is a missed opportunity because this is such a uh, enormously growing area. People come in for a day and spend big amounts of money in the city being tourists for just a short period of time and, and Melbourne's missing out. Well, it's shameful and embarrassing. And when you think uh, how aggressive and successful Victoria has been in winning events, you know, they put on amazing events and they're more uh, successful than any other state in terms of winning these events. And you just can't understand why they'd be missing this great opportunity. The shipping market, the cruising market's so huge. I mean, speaking as a Sydney sider, I'm quite glad that, you know, that Victoria isn't doing so well in that front. But it, it's just a lost opportunity and Victoria needs all the income it can get. And I just feel very sad for all the, the retailers and the ancillary hospitality people who are missing out on this great opportunity just because... They don't give a damn about it, clearly. Now, let's go to the US, where President Joe Biden has been hounded by protesters at campaign events well, for months now over his administration's response to the Israel conflict. And ever since Israel killed those aid workers in a mistaken airstrike, the protest calls have grown even louder, even from his own wife, Jill, as our Washington correspondent Annalise Nielsen reports. This week it also emerged First Lady Jill Biden has been putting pressure on her husband over Gaza as well. Jill Biden has reportedly said to Joe Biden, stop it, stop it now, according to Salima Suswell, leader of the Black Muslim Leadership Council, who recounted the conversation from the White House Ramadan dinner. Pro, he's facing opposition from the hard left squad, which are uh, within his own party, the, the swing states, his own wife now. Uh, can we expect him to do the right thing, to, to stay strong beside Israel, or is he going to fold? Well, firstly, uh, Jill Biden's judgment is very questionable. If she was really on the ball, she would have been telling her husband to resign, to step down. That's the first thing. But <laughs> I, I have to say, I just... Uh, I, I see him weakening. You know, he's still providing uh, the funds and the, the mis military, you know, aid that they need, Israel needs. But the pressure must be enormous. And... You know, it's just appalling that all these international countries, including our own, of course, which is just a disgrace, are, you know, putting all the blame on Israel. They're being, becoming the propaganda agents of Hamas. This is exactly what Hamas wants, to make Israel the bad guy. Um, and meanwhile, we know what Israel has to do. They have to eliminate Hamas. Uh, if they don't, they're just going to be facing worse than they did on October 7. And it's just appalling that they're being targeted by the rest of the world and isolated as they are. And let's hope that Biden doesn't succumb. It's a lot of political woke pressure on him. He's not a very strong leader, as we know, but let's hope he doesn't pull wow, the plug yes. on so, in helping them. Well, yeah, it's whoever's pulling the strings in the White House, let's be honest. I don't think President yeah, exactly. Biden has much idea what's happening day to day. Mm. Now, the president, El Salvador, this is just fascinating. He's already achieved astounding success by slashing his country's crime rate. Uh, he's built these mega prisons. He's rounded up all the repeat offenders and gangbangers and... He's continuing his nation-building mission for El Salvador, announcing this on Expert. He said that his government is offering 5,000 free passports to highly skilled scientists, engineers, doctors, artists and philosophers from across the world. He's offering all sorts of inducements, including 0% taxes and tariffs. It's a bold move. But like the mega prisons, uh, his track record stands up against all the lefty criticism that he cops. And certainly the, the people of El Salvador seem to love him. He's just been re-elected with something like 80% of the vote, if, if not more than that. So what do you make of this uh, 
plan by Naive Bukele. What kind of an inducement could we offer him to come over here and fix this joint? I mean, he's just <laughs> what we need. <laughs> I mean, the guy sounds like he's really on a winner. We need this kind of incentive to, in, uh, you know, incentivize tradies to come here. I think he's really sensible and good on him. Uh, and I, I take my hat off to yeah. the guy. Well, yeah, never mind doctors and engineers and, and scientists. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll settle for, for just tradies. Whatever tradies exactly. you can bring, please <laughs> move here immediately. Prue McSween, thank you for your time tonight. <laughs> Thanks, Rita. U.S. and NATO officials are warning that a shortage of ammunition and military equipment in Ukraine will have a dire effect on the battlefield as aid pathways become increasingly jammed. Russia has been ramping up attacks on the major cities of Kharkiv and Kiev in recent weeks, knowing that Ukraine supplies are running out and replenishments are not on their way. President Zelensky is pleading with the U.S. for more aid, insisting his country will lose the war if Congress blocks tens of billions of dollars in military assistance for Ukraine. Meanwhile, Australia's own support has been slipping in recent weeks. Are we also putting Ukraine at risk of defeat with our inaction? Joining me now is Stefan Romanu, co-chair of the Australian Federation of Ukrainian Organisations. Where are we in this conflict, Stefan? Uh, is Australia doing enough? Look, I think we've got to balance this thing. Up until now, uh, we've had support from the Australian government. I think the positive part about it is we have bi uh, bipartisan support. But at the moment, we're calling for more support. And I think uh, President Zelensky understands that uh, the international community has to do more. So our call out to the Australian government is, thank you for what you've done, mm -hmm. but there's a lot more that has to be done now. And I just want to make the point that um, this war has been around for 10, 10 years, actually, but the, the full uh, Russian invasion of two years. Mm. Uh, two years ago, we all spoke about values. We all spoke about why we, why Ukraine has to win, why Russia has to lose. Yep. We keep telling the same thing. The question is, are we going to provide the support that we need? So our call out to the Australian government is we need to act now. You know, I like to use uh, the, Nike, the Nike slogan, just do it. Well, as part of the... Uh fall in support related to fatigue, Ukraine fatigue, because like you said, it's been a couple of years since the invasion and uh, other conflicts have begun and, and people's attention has been pulled elsewhere. Do, do you think that's adding to the government inaction in this area? Well, I think that the, the, the issue is there are all, there's always international tension. This war is raging. Mm. Uh, it's gone off the front pages. We're saying it needs to stay on the front page because... I go back to what we said, why it's very important for Ukraine to win. If you want a better world, if you want Russian dominance, if you want Putin to be running this world, mm. uh, don't support Ukraine. What is a likely end to this? Is it going to be a negotiated agreement? Is it going to be Russia conceding defeat? You just look at someone like a Vladimir Putin and you can't see him taking that loss. He doesn't want to lose face. What, how do you see this conflict ending? You've got to look at the Ukrainian, uh, the Ukrainian people. The Ukrainian people are fighting for sovereignty, uh, territorial integrity, which they're allowed to have. They've been given that. Um, the way the Ukrainians are fighting today, and, and people say, so sometimes say that Russia is winning. Russia is not winning. Mm. If you look at what really is happening, Ukraine is winning. But how it's all going to end? Um, President Zelensky is very, very clear. Um, there will be no giving up of Ukrainian land. We will not turn around and say, well, we'll not concede. Uh, therefore, uh, Russia can be defeated. Mm -hmm. It can be defeated. But the US, Europe, uh, the Five Eyes, mm -hmm. um, those, th they have to stand up. And, that, and what, what does it mean? It doesn't mean just do it in terms of, yes, we support. You have to act. And that's why we're calling out an Australian government. I mean, we have decommissioned things that we've, we've got Abraham tanks. We have things we could be sending. We had the Taipans. We so could have sent them. So we've decommissioned them. We've got no use for them. We've got no and use we for them. we could send them to Ukraine, but we're opting not to do that. Well, the, defense, the Department of Defence has to make a call. And we're saying, you know, there are things that you can give Ukraine now. Ukraine, I mean, I can't speak on behalf of the Ukrainian government, but I do know I've spoken to the ambassador. So I spoke to people in Ukraine. You know, you take the Taipans. Ukraine was prepared to send an Antonov. It was prepared to have the international maintenance people look at the 
the Taipans, it was prepared to give Australia all care, no responsibility. So I'm not sure why we can't be giving these things. And we our... don't even have an embassy reopened there. Well, look, we, that... Most countries do. Yeah, and, and that... To us, that's ridiculous. I know the argument, and I think I spoke to you the other day, uh, about this, this some legislation that the Secretary of Foreign Affairs... Um, you know, uh, there are... Uh, the only people outside of uh, Kyiv now uh, in Poland are, are those who are pro-Russian. So all the allies... Um, you know, for example, you, the UK, uh, the British... They didn't even leave. So, so we they didn't... never closed their embassy. They never closed their embassy. Yep. And all the other allies are back. open yep. except Australia. And if you look at the where we co-share, the Canadians are back. Mm. So we just don't understand it. And we know that it will be far more effective to have an Australian diplomat on the ground talking face-to-face -face instead of Zooming. So our call out, the Australian government, is, you know, let's... let's be realistic about this. There is absolutely no reason for uh, logical reason. Mm. There might be some legal, but no logical reason for the embassy not to be back in Kiev. And we've got embassies in all sorts of dangerous parts of the world, so it seems odd that we've uh, yeah. opted to go down this road. Now, last month, the uh, Ukrainian ambassador blasted the ABC's Ukraine war documentary. He called it the journalistic equivalent of a ball of vomit. The Four Corners episode, Ukraine's War, The Other Side, promised to offer a human perspective on life on the Russian front line, but was slammed as spreading blatant lies and Kremlin propaganda. The ABC's editorial director, Gavin Fang, met with Ukraine's representatives. Uh, give us uh, the latest on that. Has there been an apology? Will they withdraw the program? What has been the outcome of, of those discussions? The Australian Federation of Ukrainian Organisations, we met with the ABC. Um, we expressed uh, our opinion. Um, when you say, oh, we've done uh, six programs about Ukraine and now we're doing this one and, you know, it's the sort of a, the human face of Russia, uh, they won't say that, but that's the way it's perceived. The fact is, those soldiers who are saying, crying, uh, I want to go, Russian soldiers, I want to go home to my mother, I want to go back to my family, are the same ones who are raping, pil pilfering. Uh, therefore, there's no sympathy for that. We've said to them that ultimately what you've done is you've given what I call, call you know, when you put something black and white, black is the fact is that Russia is bad, white the fact is Ukraine's fight. Now you put it in together and you've got grey. So people are saying, oh, maybe the Russians aren't so bad. We've spoken to them. Um, we have also given them what we call some remedies. Uh, we're talking to them now. Um, for example, we have a showing here of... Uh, 20 Days in Mariupol, the one that won the Oscar Awards. A horrific situation about, you know, when you see a baby uh, dying, when you see a father crying, um, they're the sort of things we're saying to uh, the ABC. So if you want to say to us that six, we've had six programs and now we've got this one, uh, you're presuming that everybody's watching those six and seven. So they need, to, they need to change their ways. We've given them a remedy. We've given them a way out. We're not about, you know, we want a win-win situation. But it hasn't been finalised. It hasn't been finalised. We're in, we're in discussions with them. We'll continue to discuss with them, but it hasn't been finalised, no. Stefan Romanew, thank you so much for your time this evening. And still to come, American actor Antonio Zabata Jr. joins me on the desk to tell his story of losing roles and being blacklisted because of his conservative views, plus a bumper edition of Lefties Losing It. Welcome back. Now it's time for Lefties Losing It. Let's start with climate catastrophist clown Greta Thunberg, who's all grown up these days but still behaving like a spoilt little brat. Here's her latest arrest. But despite her grinning like a nincompoop throughout that and running happily into the bus, the narrative by the lefties online was that she was brutalised by the police. Here's one viral tweet using a still image, not the video, and claiming Dutch police use controversial boca putchy wristband on 4 foot 11. Greta, she only 4 foot 11 uh, for protesting climate collapse and genocide at The Hague. Oh my gosh. Calm down, love. And incredibly, former ABC stalwart Quentin Dempster reposted that tweet with this comment. 
Policeman inflicts painful wrist hold on protester Greta Thunberg. This enduring image symbolises the abuses of law enforcement, which permits the destruction of Earth's biosphere by excessive emissions of carbon dioxide and methane. Struth, in the words of John McEnroe, you cannot be serious. Moving along, let's uh, check in with South Carolina women's basketball coach Dawn Staley, who managed to be both a coward and a reality denier, and also she ended up playing the victim all at once. Uh, quite the trifecta there. Let's see how this question about protecting women's sport unfolded. Watch for the lengthy pause before the harebrained answer. One of the major issues facing women's sports right now is the debate discussion topic about the inclusion of transgender athletes, biological males in women's sports. I was wondering if you would tell me your position on that issue. Um, damn, you got deep on me, didn't you? <laughs> I, I, I'm on the, I mean, I'm on the, the, opinion of of if you're a woman you should play if you consider yourself a woman or and you want to play sports or, or vice versa let's just stop there for a second there is no vice versa there are no trans men that's biological women identifying as men who are wanting to compete at the highest level against real biological men. Women cannot compete against men and to pretend otherwise is to deny reality and to throw women under the bus. Men are stronger, faster, bigger. It's just simply unfair on female athletes to ask them to compete against male bodies. But watch here as Dawn plays the victim despite the fact that she did throw female athletes under the bus. Do you, do you think uh, transgender women should be able to participate that, in that, That's your question you want basketball. me to ask. I mean, you want to ask, so I'll, I'll give you that. Yes. Yes. So now the barnstorm of people are going to flood my timeline <laughs> and be a distraction to me on one of the biggest uh, days of, of, of our game. And I'm okay with that. I really am. Pathetic, weak, can I just uh, play Serena Williams here? This is a bit of a rebuttal to this notion that men and women are pretty much the same. They can compete with each other. If I were to play Andy Murray, I would lose 6-0, in five to six minutes, maybe 10 minutes, because... It's not, no, it's are, true. It's honestly, true. It's a completely... Really. It's a completely different sport. The men are a lot faster, and me and um, they they get they serve harder, they hit harder. It's just a different game. And I love to play women's tennis, and I I only want to play girls because I don't want to be embarrassed. I would not do the tour. Did you hear that? She wouldn't play if she had to play men. She wouldn't be on the tour. Now to the White House, and uh, let's check in on the Veep. Kamala can always be relied upon for some solid lefties losing it content. Do you know, okay, a bit of a history lesson. Do you know that women were not, the women's teams were not allowed to have brackets until 2022? Think about that and what that talk about progress, you know, better late than never, but progress and what that has done. Because, of course, when, you know, I had a bracket, I'm, it's not broken completely, but I won't talk <laughs> about my bracket. But, you know, what? just the, how we love, we love March Madness and even just now allowing the women to have brackets and what that does to encourage people to talk more about the women's teams, to watch them. Now they're being covered. You know, and, and this is the reality. People used to say, oh, women's sports, who's interested? Well, if you can't see it, you won't be. But when you see it, you realize, oh. Wow. I'm speechless, really. I mean, not only is that nonsensical, it is also absolutely false, obviously. I mean, how any politician <laughs> could say that to a reporter let alone the woman who's uh, one heartbeat away from the presidency, one 80-year-old heartbeat away from the presidency. Thank God the president is in such good health. 
Uh, this is Morgan Sherwin and uh, Sam Saruti. Uh, 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 they're our, our team members here. Uh, they help us. They uh, they help us, uh, you know, service and sales. Oh dear. Let's end lefties on a positive note. Here's a lovely, heartwarming video of a much loved teacher being pranked by his students. <laughs> Now, you might recognise my next guest from his roles in General Hospital, Charm, The Bold and the Beautiful and Melrose Place. You're the only woman I'll ever be married to. Oh, my God. Amanda, ah! you're mine. Tonight, for the rest of your life, you're mine. Aren't we just one big happy family? What is this? I'm setting up a cable system here in LA. And D and D is in on the ground floor. He was a Calvin Klein model, supermodel, a Hollywood heartthrob, and a movie star. But once he came out as a conservative, suddenly the roles dried up. He's in Australia to attend the Supernova Convention, and while he's here, he will launch his book Sabato, the Untold Story. And he joins me now. You have a Fantastic Hollywood career. The, the list is long of, of the productions you've been, TV, movies. But tell me what happened when you came out and said, I'm supporting Donald Trump. That was, what, back in 2016? Yeah, that was a while ago, and uh, I guess that's that's how things work out. You know, when you disagree with certain people and they're in higher power, they, they have an opinion. But it only made me stronger. I'm much better of a person. I, I just uh, tell the truth. I love to live on, on truth. That's mm. just uh, how my parents raised me. Uh, you know, we came from Italy to the States uh, to be good people, to have dignity and honor. And so uh, I'm a much stronger and tougher person than i ever been. But uh, I want to live on truth, and that's what I did. I spoke my mind. But it must hurt because it was an industry you were just a part of for so long. Um, Mm -hmm. Role after role, and then to have that kind of people you, I guess, you considered friends and colleagues yeah. turn their back on you, it must hurt. Well, not really, because my father was an actor before me. I already knew this was going to happen, you know, in some certain type of degree. But uh, I am right, and they were wrong. They yeah. were all wrong all along. So, you know what? I feel good that I sleep good at night. And you know what? If they don't want to hire me based on an opinion, then I don't want to work with them anyway. And at the end of the day, I'm going to work with people that uh, want to hire me for, for my craft. Mm. For what I am as an actor and what I can bring to the table, but you know, we shouldn't be arguing or having really big debates to a point where you're not higher based on political stuff. That shouldn't be like that. No, absolutely, and you see it happening with with uh, other really successful actors and creators, people yeah. like Tim Allen, Roseanne yeah. had top rating sitcoms when sure. they were cancelled. It seems like. Other than Clint, Clint Eastwood, no one's big enough to survive this McCarthyism. If you see, if you, as... my opinion is, if you're a sheep and you follow and you don't say anything, and the more you do that, then they're gonna just overcome everything. But the truth always will come out at the end of the day. I'm still working. I have a great film called Grace by Night coming out. It's probably my best project. I've done other. I've done a lot of other stuff in between other type of careers. And I'm going to keep moving forward, and they're not going to stop me, and I'm going to keep being in this business whether they like it or not. But at the end of the day, they should appreciate the fact that this man, myself, stood for something that is right, that he believes. Uh, and I think, I, like I said, at the end of the day, I was right, and they were all wrong. Absolutely. And I think <laughs> audiences are crying out for that as well. They're sick of being preached to by Hollywood. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and they're sick of seeing projects that would be entertaining if they weren't just filled with political messaging and we're seeing that a lot in films it yeah. seems to be destroying a lot of productions where yeah. they're, they're basically giving the middle finger to at least half the population you're absolutely right because you know entertainment should be about entertaining it shouldn't be about propaganda and about you know changing people's views and you're right because hollywood is putting their their two cents and is becoming the whole market 
and they should stop right away. But I think, like you said, people are stopping, and hopefully they're waking up. They just want to be entertained. Exactly. We have a lot of news going on. You do this every day, right? Definitely. So yes. and, and it's mostly negative, and I think entertainment world was a place where you can make people happy for an hour and a half of the day yeah. where you can just take them away. And that's what I wanted to do it for, you know, and everything else shouldn't matter, you know. And I think if we fight for that, the more we st you stand up for that, I think we'll succeed at the end. Now, not only are the projects highly political, we've got so many actors and artists who are very political. I mean, the <laughs> list is endless, but uh, the likes of, like, Ben Midler, Barbara Streisand, Mark Hamill, you see them tweeting daily all sorts of really sometimes lunatic left stuff, fringe stuff. Non-stop. Non-stop, but, non -stop, mm -hmm. but it never seems to hurt them. The, the media doesn't do hit pieces on them when they're wildly wrong about yeah. things that they've posted. Mm -hmm. it, is this the Hollywood mindset? Does everyone agree with them in Hollywood or are there others who think they're idiots but they're, they're cowed yeah. into silence because they've seen what's happened to people like you and You know, in the old days, I respect actors like Brando and Paul Newman. These guys are actually very smart and they actually read something. These, these new people, like, I mean, like all these names you brought up, they're very ignorant on subjects that they shouldn't even talk about. They're very good at making films. They're very good at reading scripts and putting projects together. But I think when you when you become a sheep and you follow another sheep, you don't really take the time to make up your own mind. I think we got to fight. That's what I'm teaching my children: is to be yourself, to follow in, to learn something, to follow your own instinct, your own gut, and to follow the truth. And like I said, at the end of the day, all these people with all these millions of dollars that they're getting in trouble with the law, they're getting in trouble with all these things. At, at the end of the day, they were all wrong. They were all wrong about everything they talked about. And if they want to keep talking that way, that's fine. But I think that the viewership, the new, the new people that are watching all these shows, I think they're a lot smarter. And I believe that in the future, at least I'm being hopeful here, okay? I'm not being, I mean, I'm trying to be hopeful and um, that I think the best is yet to come. I agree with you. I think there's a real awakening, particularly in America, and you see that with the audience numbers even for things like the Academy Awards or the Grammys. Yeah. They're plummeting because people are just yeah. sick of this preachiness and they're demanding something better from from their yeah, arts. Class and dignity and honour and to stand up for something is right. And I think out there they're going to look at me and go, you know what, Antonio, at the end of the day, we might disagree with something political, whatever it may be, but you got to respect the fact that people that stand up against everybody else that is following the herd, you got to respect that. And I sleep good at night. I'm good. Yeah, you sleep good. And I tell you, um, there are plenty of hypocrites in Hollywood. Oh, Hollywood. Yeah. Do you want to name a couple here? Uh, who do you see as the biggest? Well, right now, we, we look at it in the news. I mean, The Rock, Dwayne Johnson, has just came out saying, you know, I didn't vote for, for, for Biden. Now I'm not going to vote for Biden again, this and that. The fact of the matter, you can look at the facts. In the last three and a half years, America has been the worst it's ever been under a president that doesn't really care about this country. I mean, my country. Mm. But Donald Trump, whether you like him or not, in those four years, we never had any wars. Our dollar was good. Our economy, you know, economy was good for everyone across the board. Our border was... I mean, those are facts. But people don't want to really see those facts because they, like, they hate the man or they hate the neighbor that told them or their friend. And that small mind, that hypocrisy that you're just talking about, it very... So a guy like that who has millions of dollars in the private jets just showed the world that your mind is this small that uh, you need to learn and be a better person. And like I said, Dwayne Johnson is worth a lot more than me in the, in the business, but I beat you because I'm a lot smarter than you because at the end of the day, I was right and you were wrong. So like I said, I might be poor, I might be on the sideline right now, but I'm sleeping good at night that God knows that I'm, I did the right thing. Well, yeah, Dwayne Johnson's copying at the rock from all corners because you're right, he came out, endorsed Biden in 2020. Yep. Now he's saying, well, I'm not going to endorse him. Uh, the Conservatives haven't forgotten what he did, but yeah. it's all the lefties who've gone nuts because I have seen him attacked mercilessly Correct. Correct. from his own side yeah. over the last 48 hours. It's been fascinating to yeah. watch. Yeah. Now, tell me about this book. Who have you written it for? Is it for the fans? Is it for the haters? Is no, it for it's the not, legacy? What's it's for the fans. It's for people that really want to be motivated because me and my family has been through so much. We lost a home. We came from, to another country. We did it the right way. We followed the law. Those are motivational stories what my mother and my father have been through with me and my sister and the four of us together as a family came to another country, we ran out of money, we went back and all the stories in Hollywood, these are just motivational stories that I wanted to share. 
with all the fans in the world because we need those stories to to, to just get people out and go, there's, there's hope out there. There's a better way. Tomorrow will be a better day. Just chill out. Don't... Because there's so much turmoil in the world. Yeah. You know, and people have gotten rid of God. They're, they're trying to push everything. All the good things that made us human beings to fight for something. You know, God, Jesus Christ, all these things. They're trying to push. And then what do you got? What do you have? We have Hollywood to lean on, lean on to. And that's not good enough, obviously. So I wanted to give them a story that could, could, could bring some hope to people that are just out and out and need something better. You know, something... There's a better tomorrow, and 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 I love seeing people just uh, driving to their best because you know I I train hard. I want to be a race car driver. As a matter of fact, any race car teams out there that want to hire a race car, a race car driver, I'm there. I want to race in America. I want to race in Australia. Those are things that's like I'm 52 years old. I can just chill out, maybe retire. No, life is good, you know? <laughs> Keep pushing yourself, you know what I mean? Absolutely. It's a fantastic message. Antonio yeah. Sabato, Jr., pleasure to have you on the program. Thank Thanks you. for coming in. My pleasure. Still to come, Rebel Wilson teases that the truth will come out about Sasha Baron Cohen as the star splits from his Aussie wife. Plus, financial troubles for the Middletons. Kinsey Schofield is up next. Welcome back. Joining me now is Royal and Entertainment reporter Kinsey Schofield. Kinsey, let's start with country music superstar Morgan Wallen. He's been on a sellout world tour. He's back in the US and at his Indiana Indianapolis concert, he took the time to thank the crowd for helping him break the record uh, for the biggest attendance at Lucas Oil Stadium. But when he mentioned Taylor Swift, well... There was a lot of booing. Let's have a look. They told me right before I walked on stage that this is the single most attended concert in the history of this building. I'm going to say that until Taylor Swift comes to town in the fall. Man. Now, he may have thought his fans and Taylor's fans were uh, very similar. They both have their roots in uh, country music. He's certainly a country music star and Taylor got her start in country music. But judging by that reaction, uh, the fans weren't on board. Uh, have we perhaps misjudged Swift mania? We kind of present her as being universally loved, but... I think like a lot of really big superstars, she's quite polarising. Her fans adore her and the ones who don't are sick and tired of seeing her. Well, I definitely think that we saw an oversaturation during the NFL season last year and early into this year. Yes. Uh, but I do think that this is just a simple case of Morgan's fans thinking they're a little too edgy to listen to Swift. Morgan is country music's bad boy. And, he, you know, we heard him. He clearly mm. defended her there and asked his fans to stop booing. Um, but his fans are sharing shots. They're not sharing friendship bracelets. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. But we've got to remember, Taylor is also a woman in her 30s. I know a lot of her fans like to think of her as a, a teenager like them, but she's she's a grown woman. Um, but, yeah, I think that the whole Taylor Swift phenomenon we can uh, uh, analyse to death. Let's move along to Fox News host Kennedy slamming the race and equity director at US, UCLA, her old college, for being one of the many armchair experts who are uh, indulging in conspiracy theories about Princess Kate, um, even saying she doesn't really have cancer. This character, Jonathan Perkins, has tweeted a series of posts questioning the cancer diagnosis, accusing the royal family of trying to silence speculation. And even on Easter Sunday, he tweeted, wait, isn't Kate Middleton supposed to rise today? Uh, What's going on here? He's recently reposted this uh, fairly telling tweet, a picture of Prince Harry and his wife Meghan with the caption, Love Wins. Uh, guys paid a six-figure salary to foster understanding, compassion and inclusiveness and yet he's mocking Princess Catherine on the basis of her cancer diagnosis. 
It's so sick. I refuse to even say his name. And if you look at the amount of tweets this nearly 40-year-old man has sent about the Princess of Wales, I don't know how you can think that there's nothing but mental instability there. I mean, it, it, it's wild. I, get a life is really what I would tell this individual. But, you know, we need to look at his track record. When he was at the University of Virginia in 2011, he stirred race relations on campus by claiming in a letter to the student paper that he was racially profiled by campus cops. Shortly after that, he admitted to lying about the whole ordeal, saying, I wrote the article to bring attention to the topic of police misconduct. The events in the article did not occur. In 2017, he lied again and said his original story was true and that the FBI made him retract it. This is not a person that uh, has a very strong relationship with the truth. Um, I cannot believe UCLA continues to employ him. Him because I think that he is a, a very scary individual. Well, yeah, and he's just indulging in absolute lies here. We're not even talking about scuttlebutt that, you know, could possibly be true. They're just crazy conspiracy theories. Now, let's talk about this news report from The Times. It reveals that Catherine's parents, Carol and Michael Middleton, are in debt, hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt after their party business collapsed last year and they cannot pay the £260,000 for insolvency firm cost. Uh, their business fell into administration owing over £2.5 million. Uh, they're obviously trying to shield their daughters from these woes, particularly Catherine. Um, how do you think uh, this story is going to unfold? Their daughter, the youngest daughter, Pippa, married a billionaire and I don't know if she's going to step in and help. Uh, what's what's the latest on this story? Yeah, I mean, I, I actually feel real sympathy about this story because the Times specifically says that Carol is Carol Middleton is trying to shield the Princess of Wales from uh, this debt that she's embarrassed by and doesn't want to burden her with. So why not splash it all over the papers? Like, you know, you hope that that yeah. reporter at the Times never has people whispering secrets in their family's ear if they're ever dealing with a health crisis. What we do know is that the Middletons are attempting to pay this off. It's not like they they've they're not trying to. They've also not asked either one of their, any of their children, I'm sorry, James, Pippa, or the Princess of Wales for any sort of help whatsoever. And they certainly haven't reached out to the, the British royal family to ask for help. It's something that they're trying to deal with in private. And honestly, with the Princess of Wales going through her cancer treatment and Carol taking a much larger role in Kate's household, I think it's almost at the back of their mind. This is something we'll figure out later. Now, let's talk about the big Hollywood news. Uh, actors Isla Fisher and Sasha Baron Cohen are divorcing. Isla announced the end of their 14-year marriage and 20-year relationship in a well, somewhat bizarre tennis-themed post on Instagram. Let's have a look at it. The timing is interesting. He's facing fairly ugly allegations of bullying and sexual harassment from movie star Rebel Wilson, whose explosive memoir he's allegedly trying to stop or delay. Is this announcement a coincidence, Kinsey? Is it in any way related to those allegations? The timing does seem to be curious. I agree with you. I do think that this is an indication that Isla was not willing to stand up and defend Sasha in the midst of such damaging allegations. Um, you know, it, it was in Isla's best interest to cut ties and no longer be a part of this narrative because, you know, she might be thinking, knowing what I know, things could get worse. I got to get out of here. In the court of public opinion, Sasha and his team know that this is not a positive reflection on his character to see his wife distance herself right now, today. Now, the mail on Sunday revealed that the real reason behind the breakup was over a disagreement about where they should live. But I think ultimately we're seeing this announcement now because uh, Isla just doesn't want to be a part of the story any, any longer. Well, that would make sense, but we should point out Sasha Baron Cohen uh, strenuously denies the allegations made against him by Rebel Wilson. And there were media reports just uh, in the last few hours that this divorce from Isla's side was planned a couple of years ago. So she, they, there's allegations that she's been 
thinking about this and, and yeah, planning yes, but, this. But so she, we'll keep... But she did just go on the Kelly Clarkson show on Valentine's Day and talk about how she spends Valentine's Day with Sasha. So this is a brand they were trying to oh, keep up. Oh, that is a good... You know what, Kinsey? That's why we need you because you you <laughs> fact check me when I need to be fact checked. Kinsey Schofield, thank you so much for your time this evening. And that's it from me tonight. Up next is Newsnight. I'll see you at 11 tomorrow. Good night.